Trigger warning. This story contains references to mental health issues, kidnapping, abuse, and violent self-inflicted death. This is the first video on YouTube to cover the strange story of F. Gwynplaine McIntyre. There are two edges to reality, each as different from the other as night is from day. There is the waking world, and then there is the dream time. In the dream time, all times and all places are one, my child, and every corner of the universe touches every other. And remember, my child, that when the dream time commands, then you must obey. For it is in the dream time that we will dance among the stars. Opening paragraph of F. Gwynplaine McIntyre's story, Martian Walkabout, published in Isaac Asimov's science fiction magazine, March 1980. In February 2002, a strange user seemingly appeared out of nowhere on the internet movie database, the IMDB, and began posting a series of baffling movie reviews that angered many in the classic film community. These were not ordinary movies, they were films that did not exist. They were lost films, silent movies, irrevocably and long lost, in some cases for a hundred years or more films desperately sought after by fans. Lost movies are a passionate subject for rabid film fans and any claim that one has been found or seen stirs up heated conversation. This IMDb writer claimed to have seen not just one, but several such films, and this created a hubbub in chat groups and forums all over the net. The forums were awash in hope, skepticism, amusement, and anger over this. The user's reviews were full of tantalizing details about plots, scenes, performances, details that would be difficult to know without having seen the films. And yes, the reviewer insisted that he had seen the films, alleging that a mysterious European aristocrat had invited him to a secretive manor via a go-between attorney to see his rare collection, on condition that he not reveal the name of the benefactor. He had been invited there, based on his alleged expertise on film, to assess the collection's prints, to assess their rarity, their condition, and to provide advice on their preservation. All very mysterious, full of intrigue, and intrigue people it did, as many hoped the story was true. This wild tale had people divided in the film community, many angrily charging BS about the whole thing, calling it a bastardization of history, misinformation a patent falsehood, while others openly expressed a hope that the stories were somehow true, that the lost movies they so ached to see just might exist after all. Over the next eight years, the user wrote a massive number of movie reviews on the IMDb, about 1,700 all told, mostly of existing films, but still occasionally about lost ones. The reviews are good, often well done, concise, precise models of excellence for the website, blending just enough detail with personal insights, opinion, and a wicked wit. The titles of his reviews were often funny, full of wordplay and puns. The writer demonstrated knowledge and an expressive talent for writing about cinema art. Then suddenly, after years of this, on June 24, 2010, the writer announced with a cheerful note of finality that he was penning his last review on the IMDb. The review was for the silent science fiction classic Metropolis, a film that the writer called his favorite. Reading the review in retrospect leaves one with strange feelings and a sense of poignancy as we shall see. 
because in fact the writer was in a bad way, sad, depressed, isolated, and despondent. Metropolis, 1927, 10 out of 10, my favorite film, my last review, 24 June, 2010. Metropolis is my all-time favorite movie, so I've saved this for the last review that I plan to write for this wonderful website, IMDb. I've enjoyed sharing my experiences of the movies I've seen, but now I'm moving on to other passions. In conclusion, he continued, For all its flaws, Metropolis will always be my favorite movie. I've enjoyed writing all these reviews for IMDb. The joy of posting my reviews on this site has brought me many friendships and a few enemies. Well, you can't win them all. Nitrate film stock doesn't last forever, and all good things come to a happy ending. This is my last review here. I'll keep watching movies, but other passions are important to me as well. Thank you, IMDB, and thank you to everyone who has read my reviews. I will happily rate Metropolis a full 10 out of 10. Signed, F. Gwynplaine McIntyre. The words and implications in the review, quote, all good things come to a happy ending, unquote. Nitrate film is impermanent, it burns, it doesn't last. These were ominous portents. The next day, June 25th, 2010, F. Gwynplaine McIntyre would die a horrible and tragic fiery death by his own hand, endangering the lives of others in the process. The details of his descent into violence and brutal death would shock the fandom in both the science fiction and silent film communities, two fandoms in which he maintained connections and some degree of fame. F. Gwynplaine McIntyre's life seemed weird. He was the quintessential man out of time, acting and dressing like someone from a hundred years ago, but most likely his was really an ordinary life, in which his internalized fantasies ultimately took him too far. And because he never sought help for himself, his situation spiraled out of control. F. Gwynplaine McIntyre, the trickster, the internet troll, the teller of improbable tales, was in fact a moderately well-known science fiction writer who'd gained the admiration of no less than Isaac Asimov and reputedly Harlan Ellison and Ray Bradbury. McIntyre published dozens of stories in Asimov's magazine, in Weird Tales, Analog, and many others. He wrote two books, one a novel in 1994 that was greeted with lukewarm reviews, but which also gained him many new admiring fans. His second book, less popular, was a compendium of oddities. There was another completed novel manuscript which apparently was not published. A hulking, six-foot-three-inch red-headed ginger neckbeard, McIntyre sometimes dressed like an English club man or a Scottish lord, to exude an air of authority and claimed he was from Scotland or from Wales or Australia or New York. He claimed a lot of things about his life that nobody could prove and ultimately that very few believed. McIntyre claimed to have lived a terrible childhood of abuse and virtual slavery, separated from a deformed twin brother and shipped to the UK to Australia by cruel parents in the 1940s to perform child labor. He wore black and white pairs of gloves in public because he claimed to have webbed fingers. He claimed to have homes in Wales, UK and in the New York City area. The latter, at least, was true. He claimed to be a world traveler and friend of the famous. He named Drop like an A-list celebrity. Claimed he was involved in many projects, though most of those projects were never finished. He touted himself as a man of many talents, an expert in widely disparate subjects, and he was clearly well-read, often just enough to bamboozle people up to a point. He was born in 1948 or earlier or later than that, nobody knew. He was often inconsistent in his biographical rambles. He spoke in various accents, British, Scottish, and American New Yorkese, a man without a country or an identity who simply made them all up. At fan conventions or film screenings, he was charming and gregarious and made friends, never truly close ones though, either in public or via email, but who ultimately would alienate and lose those friends with equal ease. 
McIntyre seemed to be a man in control, confident in his bluster, often arrogant and sarcastic, but who over time let even those qualities slip as he receded into self-pity and reclusive isolation, hoarding detritus and becoming abusive to neighbors and acquaintances. He lived in an old apartment in the Bensonhurst section of Brooklyn, New York, living in squalor within his demented fantasies amid a space overstuffed with odds and ends that constituted some sort of valuable archive that made sense only to him. F. Gwynplaine McIntyre was a fantasist who lived in a fantasy world. He wrote science fiction and he also wrote a life for himself, one that seemed to have come from magazines and books and movies. He invented his character and played it to the hilt. But somewhere along the way, reality clashed with his fantasy and his fantasies turned dark. He evolved from a cheery, confident, sociable young man into a disturbed and sometimes violent sociopath. What we know about Fergus Gwynplaine McIntyre comes largely from the most unreliable of sources, F. Gwynplaine McIntyre himself. From the outset, it's best to assume that none of the biographies on him are accurate or true at all, not even the one on Wikipedia. The most we have are his works and the memories of those who met him. Many of these testimonials, good and bad, came after his death. Fergus McIntyre is a Scottish name, but there is no proof that he was born in Scotland in 1948 or on any of the other dates that have surfaced. He claimed to have been evacuated from England as a child during or right after World War II, but photos of him from the 1980s show that he was clearly too young to have been alive that far back. He claimed to have been married two or three times, but searches of the New York marriage records under his many aliases turn up nothing. No one has ever come forward claiming to have been his spouse. Where his many names came from is unknown, likely his vivid imagination. At least part of his name, Gwynplaine, appears to have been taken from the name of Conrad Veidt's character Gwynplaine in one of his favorite films, the 1928 silent gothic horror melodrama The Man Who Laughs, adapted from Victor Hugo, but McIntyre denied it. Yet on another occasion, he confirmed it. Given the outcast nature of that ridiculed character, it's easy to see why he might have identified with that tortured soul and taken that name. Somehow, he was able to get away with using multiple names. F. Gwynplaine McIntyre as his real name and pen name, the name Timothy C. Allen for taxes, Paul G. Jeffery for his passport, and Oleg V. Bredekin for his magazine subscriptions. One person claimed his real name was Jeremy McIntyre, which may be closer to reality, but we don't really know that either. He signed many of his autographs as Froggy, and it is by that nickname that many knew him. Another common name used by his friends was Fergus. He claimed to have a second home in Wales, and despite there being photos of him in travels, including one of him touring Stonehenge, the most likely truth is that McIntyre was born and raised in New York and lived there for most of his life. Almost nothing is known about his early life. He claimed to have worked with the famous TV producer Lord Lou Grade in England in the 1960s, which is almost certainly not true. He said he hung out with the Oxford crowd and worked with a printer in London. His alleged banishment to Australia as a child in the 1950s under an infamous UK child migration program was the work of his evil and abusive family, he said, and he harbored particular scorn for his mother, who he blamed for most of his troubles. In the 1970s, McIntyre claimed to work for a publisher of pornographic fiction in New York. Already, Froggy was part of the science fiction convention fandom and practiced journalism, interviewing notable science fiction writer Alfred Bester for an article in 1979. One acquaintance remembered Froggy as having a job as a proofreader at the time. Another remembered him as a typesetter working somewhere on 23rd Street. One online commenter named Jim claimed he'd first met Froggy at a sci-fi convention way back in 1976 when the budding writer was still mainly just a fan himself. Jim remembered McIntyre as eccentric but engaging. Through the years, Jim recalled seeing Froggy out and about at places like Penn Station. Another acquaintance named Peter remembered Froggy, then known as Frogwell, working in 1973 as a stagehand in a New York-based theater company. 
Already, the theatrical bent that would influence Froggy's life was taking shape. Peter remembered Froggy as being a teenager at the time, which would make his birth date sometime in the 1950s and not the 1940s, as he'd claimed. Another New Yorker named Billy recalled Froggy in the 1970s as a delightful, witty, utterly charming eccentric who seemed to be a throwback to a bygone Edwardian era. He also recalled Froggy being an early organizer of one of the first New York Star Trek conventions back then. Froggy allegedly showed up at a Monty Python stage show in New York in 1976 wearing a frog mask to demand royalty payments from the comedy troupe for work he'd claimed to have done for Python's television show. The story appears apocryphal, but one acquaintance named Mark claims it was true. A person named Constance remembered talking to McIntyre back in the 1980s at a science fiction and fantasy writers association event and said he was kind and helpful to her, and she never forgot it. In the wake of McIntyre's passing, there were many such online remembrances of his friendliness at fan events through the 1980s and 1990s. In those earlier times, those who encountered Froggy already noted his erratic and strange behaviors. One recalled Froggy as, quote, an eccentric boy who made things up, unquote. We pick up the first solid paper trail of his life in 1980, when Isaac Asimov's science fiction magazine gave him his first break as a writer and accepted his first very slight story, titled For Cheddar or Worse, for its January 1980 edition. The story is minor, the work of an above-average high school student, but it is full of the crazy punning wordplay that Froggy would become notorious for, especially later on the IMDb. Isaac Asimov reportedly called Froggy, quote, the best writer of light verse since Ogden Nash, unquote. It's a quote that sounds suspiciously from Froggy himself, but who knows. Froggy's career appeared to be on the rise, especially after publishing the acclaimed story Martian Walkabout in Isaac Asimov's science fiction magazine in March 1980, and which was anthologized the next year in the compendium book The Best Science Fiction of the Year No. 10 by Pocket Books, a widely distributed book. Scroll through the Internet Archive today and you'll get some idea of the depth and breadth of what he wrote over the next two decades. Typing F. Gwynplaine McIntyre in the search bar there nets 234 results. Froggy's talent for coining words drew the attention of the famous New York Times columnist and word enthusiast William Sapphire. Froggy frequented the film festival circuit and silent film revival screenings, especially in the New York City area. Many remembered him at those events and were charmed by his wit, knowledge, and quirks. Like many film fans in the 1970s through the 1990s, Froggy claimed to be a friend of William K. Everson, the legendary New York film scholar who pioneered silent film preservation and education. This is entirely plausible, as Everson's cadre of film mavens was large, and it included the director, Martin Scorsese. People recalled seeing Froggy at the LunaCon, science fiction and fantasy conventions in New York, the ReaderCon events in Boston, TuscCon in Arizona, the ICON events in New York, among many others. Froggy claimed to have attended the Pordenone Silent Film Festival in Italy back in the 1990s. This photograph of Froggy purportedly in Italy may or may not be proof. Not everyone was a Froggy fan, though, particularly his later incarnation. If he disagreed with you, sometimes over minor points, he could banish you from his life. People often initially charmed by him would go away feeling burned by Froggy's caprices. One former acquaintance expressed the mixed feeling of still liking Froggy despite his rejection. As one wrote in 2010 after his death, Despite his having given me the cold shoulder for no discernible reason, I have fond memories of F. Gwynplaine McIntyre. As Froggy's faculties declined, his writerly talent did also. An agent and editor recalls how McIntyre's imagination and confidence dissolved in his last years, and most of what he said constituted pathetic pleadings and personal grievances. A credit on a 2006 documentary about silent film star Theda Berra was one of McIntyre's last contributions. 
By the 2000s, McIntyre had all but withdrawn from the fan circuit, possibly still attending film screenings, but largely becoming reclusive, maintaining what relations he had by email. His apartment became cluttered with bills, correspondence, magazines, newspapers, books, and trash and detritus, a virtual tinderbox. Part of the paper piles included taxes and other bills that he apparently ignored and refused to pay, or that he simply couldn't. These worldly concerns perhaps compounded his already worsening state. McIntyre continued writing to earn income, including contributing articles to the New York Daily News from 2002 to 2005, but the money wasn't enough. His landlord tried variously to kick him out, but for whatever reason, failed to do so. Like many cantankerous eccentrics, McIntyre stuck his nose into all sorts of issues, writing letters to the editor of the New York Times and the New York Daily News on sundry and wide-ranging issues, sometimes with odd opinions on everything from JFK to Brett Favre to the French people, and also calling into the talk shows of New York radio stations such as WOR. McIntyre once claimed to own rare letters from Abraham Lincoln, but when a scholar tried to verify them, Froggy claimed they'd mysteriously disappeared. Apart from a downstairs neighbor named Ben, almost nobody in his building or in Froggy's neighborhood knew that the eccentric shabby man lugging around books and his travels to and fro was a writer of some notoriety. Many in the neighborhood just pointed at him and laughed. The unhealthiness of his mind came to the fore in the year 2000, when he became enraged and argued with a neighbor, subsequently kidnapping her, duct-taping her to a chair, shaving her head, and spray-painting her black. He was arrested and pled guilty to third-degree assault, but apparently served no time. Despite his increasingly erratic behavior, there's no evidence that Froggy ever thought he needed professional help or medication, or if he did, he did not seek them. Was he being a martyr to his pain, as part of his personal myth of heroism or struggle or identity, or was he just stubborn or simply succumbing to lack of treatment? No one knows. It was clear to many who were in touch with him that his depression was worsening by the mid-2000s. As one online friend who met him three years before his death said, quote, His pain was evident, and we agonized and hoped and prayed that he'd change his outlook, unquote. McIntyre's notorious run on the IMDb started in 2002 with his review of the 1929 Lon Chaney lost film, Seven Faces, and already he was making judgments about films he couldn't possibly have seen. White actor Paul Muni, for instance, played a black character in the film, and quoting McIntyre, his, quote, depiction of a black man is more realistic than we might expect, whatever that means. The reviews often demonstrated Froggy's wordplay penchant and wit, and the lead-off headline for his review of the lost 1930 film The Gorilla is one of my favorite examples. Harry Gribben ties a ribbon on a greasy, grimy gibbon. The film fan community responded with bafflement to these reviews. The typical chat board thread repeated over and over would go something like this. Quote, what about this guy on the IMDb who claims to have seen The Terror, unquote, a 1928 lost horror film? Response, quote, always take something F. Gwynplaine McIntyre writes with a grain of salt. That guy is flakier than a bowl of breakfast cereal, unquote. And Froggy's lost film reviews kept coming. The 1928 Tilly's punctured romance with W.C. Fields lost but seen somehow by McIntyre. The Cat Creeps, 1930, The Golem and the Dancing Girl, 1917, The Monkey Talks, 1927, Der Janiskopf, 1920, directed by F.W. Murnau, The Big City, 1928, The Gorilla, 1927, all these and more lost but seen somehow by McIntyre. You get the pattern. Occasionally, McIntyre would disrupt the pattern and write a review for a lost film, such as Convention City, and admit that he had not seen it. The reaction to all of this was mixed. Some found the reviews amusing, little works of art that shouldn't be taken seriously and which ought to be left intact on the IMDb. Others were just as adamant that they should be taken down, since such things tend to find their way into otherwise legitimate literature and then need to be debunked. 
As one forum user said, quote, It doesn't matter how good a science fiction writer he is, his reviews of lost films are still bogus and should be pulled. That's what irritates people, not the acknowledged quality of his fiction, unquote. What made Froggy's write-up so convincing was his knowledge of the whole silent film hobby. He knew the mechanics of the trade, the secretive nature of collectors having prints they weren't supposed to have, and how prints supposedly lost could and had turned up in odd places after being written off. Froggy knew how to exploit these stories of the lost and the found to create his own mythology based on them. On June 28, 2010, hobbyist and film historian Bruce Calvert reposted on the Nitrateville board a conversation between himself and McIntyre about all this, which was once on Froggy's now mostly deleted website. The following is a highly edited version. The full version on Nitrateville makes for fascinating reading. Calvert, you've seen all these movies you've reviewed on IMDb? Froggy, almost all, but not all of them. Whenever I've reviewed a movie without seeing it, I say so in the review, and I explain what sources my review is based upon. If there's no disclaimer in the review, then I've seen at least one version of the movie, or at least a partial version. Even though I've watched thousands of movies, I actually spend more time reading books. For one thing, I can speed read a book without losing comprehension or pleasure. If I watch a silent movie through a Steenbeck viewer and I crank it fast, I can still read all the intertitles and enjoy the full story in only half the running time. Calvert, how did you get to see so many obscure movies? Froggy, unlike those idiots who see Star Wars or Rocky Horror Picture Show 28,000 times and then think this is something to brag about, I almost never watch a movie twice. This gives me more time to see movies I've never seen before. The world doesn't need one more poncy critique of It's a Wonderful Life for Citizen Kane. I'm fortunate to possess the time and resources to travel thousands of miles to view a scratchy print at a local film festival or in a private collector's archive. I'm willing to go where the films are. I'm able to see movies that aren't on DVD at your local Crockbuster video. Calvert, some of the old movies you claim you've seen are lost. What's going on? Froggy, I would well and truly love to meet this bloody wanker so-called expert who gets to decide which movies are lost. On his day off, he probably visits the parents of missing children to tell them their kids are dead and never coming back. For one thing, a gratifyingly large number of so-called lost movies have been found again, often in a nation other than where they originated. Very often, a so-called lost film turns out merely to have been mislaid. For decades, archivists at the Library of Congress hoped to discover a print of the 1926 film You Never Know Women. They finally discovered one in a storage room at the Library of Congress. One reason I'm able to see so-called lost films is because film archivists don't always share their information with each other. At public screenings, Mr. Everson screened movies that were so rare and obscure that they aren't even listed on IMDb. I can name these films and describe them, but anyone who uses IMDb as their authority will claim that these movies are so lost that they never existed in the first place. Occasionally, unauthorized duplicate prints were made without the consent of the movie's copyright holders. The authorized release print was then rushed back to the cinema in time for the next day's matinee screening. In recent years, I've had occasional dealings with a private individual whose grandfather during the 1930s and earlier obtained illegal duplicate prints of a significant number of movies. And so on. Several film historians, including author Thomas Gwadish of the Louise Brooks Society, also pressed McIntyre in good faith for more information about his apparent finds. McIntyre again would explain himself up to a point, but if Froggy was pressed too much or grew tired of the game, he'd withdraw from the conversation. He'd slip away like a thief in the night, leading everyone to the inevitable conclusion that McIntyre was a pathological liar. As it happened, some of the IMDb reviews were pulled, apparently by moderators, but some still survive on the IMDb to this day. One of Froggy's favorite activities was combing the shelves at the New York Public Library, and it was here, many believed, that he called the information from old newspapers and trade publications for his infamous film reviews. 
Eventually, McIntyre scaled back his IMDb activity, and according to some, it was part of his plan to focus on more substantial work, including a screenplay and some new novels. The day that McIntyre posted his final review of the film Metropolis on the IMDb in late June 2010, he told neighbors he was tired of living and emailed a friend about his despondent state of mind. Concerned that McIntyre was planning something rash, the friend called authorities who showed up at Froggy's apartment to take him to a hospital for observation. Froggy was apoplectic about this and fought with the police, yelling and resisting arrest. One eyewitness said he threatened to take the building down with him. Froggy was a big guy and it took six police to subdue him. After a few hours of evaluation, the hospital let McIntyre leave. Nobody knows why. An overburdened and uncaring system? It's a common story. Back home and still angry, McIntyre sent out a cryptic email to various people, criticizing the friend who'd tried to help him by calling the police. That morning, Froggy spread gasoline over his papers and lit the place up at 9.30 a.m. He sat in a chair and let the flames devour him. Twelve fire trucks and sixty firefighters battled the resulting blaze for an hour. An upstairs neighbor was treated for smoke inhalation. Luckily, no one else was killed. Froggy's blackened corpse was hauled out and away. Officials and cleanup crews entered the ransacked and burned out unit and found conditions they likened to the infamous Collier Brothers hoarders of the 1940s. The place was strewn with books and papers of all kinds, including many unfinished manuscripts. Virtually all of it was hauled out by a five-man crew over two days and tossed into a 20-yard-long trash bin. Ironically, it was all now lost media. The follow-up to this story was equally bizarre. Authorities struggled to figure out who the hell McIntyre even was before they could find a family member to claim or identify his body. Eventually, someone oddly named P. Toad McIntyre, a brother, came forward to identify him. This and odd emails that appeared subsequently and alleged sightings of McIntyre himself after his presumed death led to many conspiracy theories that Froggy had faked his death, substituting someone else's body in the fiery apartment, and so on. But as far as the authorities were concerned, the case was closed. Stories in the press and discussions in movie and literature forums expressed sadness over the wasted potential of Froggy's life, the lack of help he received, as well as a certain admiration for his eccentricities. But this presentation of him garnered equal scorn by many who complained about what they saw as a glamorization of McIntyre, particularly his irresponsible actions that endangered the lives of others. Apart from that, some were miffed at the outright pattern of lies he'd spread. Marilyn Slater wrote this in September 2010 on the Looking for Mabel Normand website, quote, it was not just his lying about seeing the Slim Princess, but as the film historian William M. Drew pointed out, it wasn't just the hoax he played on me, but, quote, he derived his sense of importance by exploiting the credibility of the whole silent film community in telling of seeing movies supposedly lost, part of a pattern not just hoaxing in general, but specifically early cinema, unquote. He exploited the void in our knowledge caused by both the loss of many films and the existing unnamed ones in archives. The internet movie database is littered with fake reviews of films he claims to have seen but which in reality he never did. He enjoyed playing games on people, but in reality he was as cruel to himself as he was to others, living in a dark and ugly fantasy world which was mirrored in his own foul apartment. As part of our culture, we are told not to speak ill of the dead, but it is hard not to do so with regard to Gwynplaine." Unquote. Whatever it was that drove McIntyre to be who he was or act as he did, we'll never know. Amateur psychologists all over the internet have tried to pin him down, but like all of us, he will always be an enigma. To this day, people still talk about him. 
as recently as 2021 and 2022, a decade after his demise, the Tapa Talk Horror Film Board saw a flurry of new threads and people still bringing up McIntyre's IMDb reviews. Agree or disagree, but the reviews stand as a testament to a passion and to an imagination. And even those who, like me, disapproved of them at the time, we can now step back and consider them differently. And maybe what's troubling about them is how well they subversively hit home about the nature of hobbyist obsession, something a lot of hobbyists perhaps don't want to consider about themselves. F. Gwynplaine McIntyre clearly adored movies, especially silent ones, and merely wanted, it seemed, to correct an injustice of history and neglect. It was an act of imagination in the face of a mindset that consigns art to the trash for the sake of convenience. Hopefully, Froggy has found peace and is partying somewhere in the netherworld with Lon Chaney and Conrad Veidt and Brigitte Helm. F. Gwynplaine McIntyre gone but, for better or worse, not forgotten. A personal note. Back in the 1990s and early 2000s, I maintained an email correspondence with a New York area film eccentric named Chris, who as it happened, paralleled the life of F. Gwynplaine McIntyre in many oddly coincidental ways. He was of the same age, lived alone with a lot of books and detritus, and ran in the same circles, and who knows, he may even have known McIntyre. He attended screenings of William K. Everson's Theodore Huff Memorial Film Society, just as McIntyre had. Chris and McIntyre had an abiding love for W.C. Fields, just as I did, and that's how Chris and I found one another. Chris passed on in 2005 after his last correspondence detailed his depression over his declining health. The next year, someone claiming to be Chris's long-lost twin brother wrote me, telling me how Chris and the brother had been separated from birth and given up for adoption, a story eerily similar to one that McIntyre told about himself. And remember, this was prior to McIntyre dying. Around the same time, a mutual friend emailed me about Chris, noting that he was writing one of Chris's friends in Wales to pass on the news of his death. A friend in Wales. Hmm, I wonder if... Nah. It couldn't be, could it? Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing. A list of the sources used for this video will be printed in the description. Thank you.